was 1990. The President of the United States was George H. Bush. And on the radio, people listened to groups like Janet Jackson and John Bon Jovi and a little-known uh, rapper by the name of Vanilla Ice. Maybe some of us remember him. And in the box office, people were watching uh, hit films like uh, Home Alone and Pretty Woman. But during this same time frame, in 1990, a group of men gathered together in Boulder, Colorado. They were being led by the football coach, and his name was Bill McCartney. And Bill McCartney was the football coach of the University of Colorado in Boulder. And they came together, and they began talking about and dreaming of a ministry for men. And as Bill McCartney began to speak about his vision, he said, what if? What if we could have a group of men who gathered together, people from all different denominations, all walks of life, all different ethnicities, all kinds of different men from different places who came together in stadiums, not to celebrate their favorite football team, but to celebrate Jesus? What could happen? And what could happen if we started to have these events all across our country and people began to show up, tens of thousands of men calling upon God and listening to uh, God's word and finding out how it is that they could become godly men? What could happen? How could this nation change? And suddenly they began to birth a brand new ministry, and the name of it was Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers. It was built upon the idea that certain promises have been made before God. Promises that are made made to God, made to our spouse, made to our children, made to our church. And these promises are all about who we are and the decisions that we make. And so this organization said, what if we were able to gather together men and call upon men to lead godly lives? How could that change our country? And as a result, Promise Keepers was born, and it began to explode. There began to become uh, events that took place in all kinds of different venues all across our country, tens of thousands of men coming together from different denominations and different groups, and they would sit and they would listen to the preaching, they would praise God together, and then it kind of came together and culminated in an event called Stand in the Gap in 2003, where an estimated 600 to 800,000 men went to Washington, D.C., And when they arrived, they began to pray, and they began to call upon God, and they began to listen to God's word being proclaimed, and call and ask God to come into our country and to heal our land. And it was an incredible moment within the history of that organization. Promise keepers. A group dedicated to helping men to keep and fulfill the promises of that they had made. But you know what? When I stop and I think about promises, I realize that there's a lot on the line when we make a promise. When you and I speak to one another and you give me your word or I give you my word, you expect me to follow through and I expect you to do the same. And so when promises are made, whether they're between two individuals or made within a marriage or made uh, within the local church or made to Jesus, those are important promises. Statements in which we speak and say, we declare that we will say, we will do certain things. And a lot is at stake. Because when promises are broken, many times lives are shattered. Relationships are torn. Marriages come apart. Division happens within the local church. And suddenly lots and lots of problems persist, all because of broken promises. And so this morning, I want us to think about that. I want us to think about the promises that we have made before God. And I want us to examine a passage of Scripture in which a group of people who were God's people, his his family, come together and they make some promises to God. But I want you to watch how things begin to unfold. And I want you to see what takes place. Because there's a lot at stake when people make promises to one another and to God. And I want us to see what God's word might have to say to you and to me as we examine that particular topic today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me now to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9. 
Uh, today we're going to be examining uh, four chapters, chapters 9 through 13, so that's a lot to kind of cover. We're going to have to really get going, uh, but we're going to examine some key verses found within these chapters that will help us to understand what is taking place as this book comes to an end. And if you'd like to follow along with us in those black Bibles in front of you, we're going to be on page 404. That's page 404. And also, if you'd like to follow along with us online, you can do so by going to yourfountain.info. Click on the, uh, the menu and then the learn link, and there you will find uh, today's passage of Scripture along with a way to take notes. And as you turn there and get prepared, let me just remind you that today we are actually wrapping up our series of messages on the book of Nehemiah called... Nehemiah, Rise Up and Build, where together we've been talking about all the events that have taken place throughout this book. And so several weeks ago, we began way back in Nehemiah chapter 1 uh, with the, the story in the beginning in which Nehemiah was located in a city called Susa, the capital city of the Persian Empire, and he was the cupbearer to the king. And he heard a message that came to him stating that the, the walls in Jerusalem had, were still in, uh, had were broken down and the city lied in ruin. And so Nehemiah began to pray. And as he prayed and prayed, God gave to him a vision. And he went before the king. And he asked for permission to go to Jerusalem. And so he went to Jerusalem and he, and he began to speak to the people and he gathered the people together and he said, Come, let us build. And they did so in 52 days. In 52 short days, they completed a, a miracle. They, they built up the, the walls surrounding this, uh, this city. And then they began to, to celebrate. They took a census of all the people, and they began to celebrate. They brought together uh, Ezra, the, scri uh, the priest and the scribe, and he began to read from the book of the law, from the law of Moses, the Torah. And as he read, they began to, to listen and learn. They began to ask questions to the priest, and then they went home. They came back the next day. They continued to study God's word, and they found written within it the need to participate in a certain feast or festival known as the Feast of Booths. And for those of you who were here last week, you remember why we went out into that tent, right, on Celebration Sunday, and we gathered under this, this temporary structure to celebrate the very same things that the Jews were celebrating. To celebrate how God has provided for us, how God has protected us, how God delivered us from our enemies. And so in the very same way, the Jews celebrated that through this festival, this Feast of Booths. And that's where we are as we get to Nehemiah chapter 9. So let's pick up the story here and see what happens next, beginning in verse 1. And as we do so, we're going to make some insights, uh, four of them, over the next four chapters. So let's begin uh, with this first one, Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, we read, Now on the 24th day of the month, of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in the place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of the day, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. All right, let's stop and think about this. We're told here that the people come together and they begin to confess. And so notice the confession that they make to God in this moment. They come together, they place a sackcloth and ashes on, on them, and so they begin to repent, and they turn to God and they make this confession for a third of the day, or roughly three hours of, of the daylight, right? They, they read God's word, and then they have this time of, of praise and worship. So it's a six-hour service. Maybe we should do that today. What do you think? Go ahead and cancel lunch plans. We're going to have a six-hour service, right? But that's what they do here, and they come together, and they begin to, to declare uh, their confessions before God. And so confession is a time in which we come before God, and we say, God, I am sorry. I'm sorry for what I have done. Sorry for the things that I've said. I'm sorry for the, the way in which I've, I've treated my spouse or I've treated uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And so they began to confess their sins before God for several hours. It was an incredible moment. Incredible moment in the history of the nation of Israel that began right here in Nehemiah chapter 9. And after this time, the Levites, they stand up. And throughout the rest of chapter 9, they begin to recount the history of Israel, going all the way back to Abraham, 
And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how God formed a people through Moses. And they began to, to talk about it and remind the people of all the things that they have just read. And then something important happens in verse 38. Scan down in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 38. The Levites, in speaking, they say these words. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. In other words, after all of this, the people come together and they say, let's enter into a covenant with God. Let's enter into a legally binding relationship with him. This is huge. Throughout the nation of Israel, the people are constantly entering into covenants. There was a covenant made with, between God and Noah. There was a covenant made between God and Abraham and his seed. There was a covenant made with David. And so God's people are entering into these kinds of relationships. And here, God's people come together and they say, we need to enter back into this relationship with him. We've been separated from God. It's time. And so they do so. It's an incredible moment in the history of of God's people here. And then in chapter 10, we begin to see the obligations that were a part of this covenant and what they are agreeing to do. They agree to be obedient to God's word and his commands. They agree to separate themselves from foreigners and those who are, are not God followers. They agree to reestablish the Levitical priesthood and the, the tithing and sacrificial systems. They agree to do all these things and to obey commands like the commands to, to honor the Sabbath and to, to keep it holy. They agree to all of these things. And they enter into this covenant with God. And then in chapter 11, we begins to see a, a census take place. Notice the census. For chapter 11, if you just scan down through that chapter, you will see name after name after name. And so Nehemiah is naming all these different people that are a part of this group at this point. And then in chapter 12, we see a celebration. Notice the celebration. In chapter 12, there's two important celebrations that take place. The first is verses 27 through 43. They dedicate the wall. People come together and they declare that God has done this incredible thing. And so they begin to celebrate this and praise him. And then in verses 44 through 47, they, they have this temple service and they begin to praise God. And suddenly, God's people have reached this mountaintop high, right? They've entered into a relationship with God. They're, they're turning back to him. And this is an incredible moment. And if Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, had ended in chapter 12, we might expect to read words like, and they lived happily ever after. But Nehemiah doesn't end in chapter 12, does it? Because it goes on to chapter 13. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, some things begin to happen which are very, very unfortunate. We discover that Nehemiah has gone back to Susa. He's gone back to, to sit underneath the, the king. He's the cupbearer to the king. He's gone back to serve him. And while he's there, he begins to hear that God's people are slowly but surely turning away from God once again. They're breaking their promises to him. And so as a result, uh, he, he begins to petition the king. He says, allow me to go back. I need to see what's, what's happening. And so he goes back to Jerusalem, and he begins to make some discoveries. And the way in which God's people have done this. And so notice what happens in chapter 13. Scan down to verse 6. We read this, that while this was taking place, I, this is Nehemiah, was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king. And came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. And then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back the, there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. What's happening here? <laughs> Why is Nehemiah so upset 
Well, what's happening is, is that Eliashib, the priest, has done something he was never supposed to do. He's allowed a foreigner, a man by the name of Tobiah, to come in and actually to live within the temple. He wasn't allowed to even come and worship in the temple, but this man has taken up residence. He's got an apartment or something, right? He's got all these furniture in there. And he goes in and he sees this, and, and, and Nehemiah says, what is going on here? What are you doing? What is happening and he begins to speak to them, and he begins to, to, to speak out against this evil, this atrocity. And do you remember who, who Tobiah was from earlier in the story? Do you remember the names Sanballat and Tobiah? These are the two men who had come against Israel when they were trying to build up the walls. These are the enemies of God. They wanted to see this destroyed, and yet this priest has befriended him and allowed him to, to step into the house of God and to take up residence. And Nehemiah is like, what is going on here? And so he confronts him. But it gets worse. Notice verse 10. Nehemiah says, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his own field. In other words, and he goes on to describe this, Nehemiah recognizes that while they have befriended the enemy, they're not taking care of the priests, the workers, the ministers of God. And so Nehemiah steps in once again and he says, what are you doing? What is going on? We made promises to God. We stood before him. We declared that we wanted to enter into a covenant relationship with him. And now we're stepping away. What is going on? How can these things be? But it gets worse. Notice verse 15. It says, In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on that day when they sold food. What's happening here? They're breaking the Sabbath. One of the Ten Commandments, God had said, honor the Sabbath. Take this day and rest, relax, set it apart, make it holy unto me. And this group of people, these Jews, have, have chosen to work and to blatantly disobey that which they knew. And so Nehemiah again steps in, confronts them, and says, what is going on here, people? Why are you doing this? You're breaking your promises to God. But it gets worse. Verse 23. In those days I also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod. And they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. In other words, the Jews have now begun to reach out and to intermarry with non-believers. Now, as a result, they're starting to have children, and those children who are Hebrews don't even know the Hebrew language. They know the language of Ashdod, but they don't even know the, the language of their own people. And so Nehemiah steps in once again, and as this story continues, he says, Don't you remember? Don't you know the history of our nation? Don't you understand that there was a guy by the name of King Solomon who made this very same error, and he went and he uh, be began to marry all these foreign women, and they led him away and led the people of, of God away too. Don't you remember that? How can these things be? And that is why Nehemiah finishes this book in this way, in verses 30 and 31. We read this, Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. That's how the book of Nehemiah ends. Remember me, O oh God, for my good. In fact, if you look through Nehemiah chapter 13, you'll see that statement is made by Nehemiah several times over and over again. And what he's saying is, God, I tried. God, I was trying to reform these people. I was trying to bring them back. I, I was there and I was with them when they made this relationship, this covenant relationship with you, when they declared their promises before you. 
and yet they have turned their back to you. And as a result, I've done everything that I can. Remember me, O God, for my good. Nehemiah, if you will remember, is a man of prayer. And this is a heartfelt prayer as he cries out to the living God and says, God, I don't know what to do. Remember me. This is a big, big moment. Because immediately following this, there's only one other book that occurs chronologically after the book of Nehemiah, and that's the book of Malachi. Malachi, a prophet, tries to steer the people back towards God, but they're not going to listen to him. And so as a result, from that point to the, forward to the New Testament, there will be 400 years of silence. Four centuries. Approximately... Ten different generations, right? Generation after generation after generation of people waiting to hear from God, and yet there is no prophet, there is no prophetess, there is no person who represents God, who stands before God's people and declares to them his his word. Wow. So suddenly, we begin to feel the weight that Nehemiah feels, and we begin to realize why this was so devastating and why it led to that time of, of silence. But what happens in the New Testament? Fast forward to the New Testament, there is a prophet who steps onto the scene. His name is John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes in the likeness of previous prophets, and he comes to reveal that soon Messiah is coming. And the Messiah is then revealed to be Jesus. And the New Testament writers say that in Jesus are all the fulfillments of God's promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 20, the Apostle Paul says that in him, in Jesus, are the fulfillment of all of God's promises. In fact, some scholars say that in Jesus, over 200 different promises of God were fulfilled. You see, God is a promise keeper, right? And in Christ, in Jesus, we see promise after promise after promise. In fact, let me give you seven of them very quickly. These are not on your outlines. And so you may want to take notes here. I want to encourage you to just write down a few words. Look up some of these passages, okay? Seven promises that are found in Jesus. There are, there are many, 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 but here are seven. You can use the word promise to just help you remember some of them. Here's the letter P. It stands for peace with God. In Jesus, we have peace with God. The letter R, rewards for God or with God. We, we receive our reward in Christ. The letter O, obedience to God. And so we are obedience to God. Our obedience comes through Christ. The letter M stands for misfortunes, or you could say trials. Jesus promised that we would receive trials and and difficulties in this life. That comes from him as well and through him. The letter I stands for instruction. We receive our instruction, our our word, the revelation of God is found within Jesus. The letter S stands for the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. When Jesus was on this earth, he told us that when he left, he had to leave in order that he might send to us the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes. And then the letter E stands for eternity. We receive eternity with God. All of these and many more promises are found in Jesus. And that's why we need him. You and I need Christ Because we cannot fulfill the promises that we have declared. We have made promises to God. And we make these promises throughout our lives. And yet in every single instance, in various ways, you and I fail to keep those promises. Think with me about some of the promises that many of us have made. Many of us stood before a group of people like the ones gathered today. And we we declare that today is the day in which I'm going to give my life to Christ I'm going to stand before you, God, and I declare that I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. From this day forward, I'm going to follow him, and we do for a time. And then we begin to struggle, right? We make various choices, and those things cause us to to sin against God, and we have to repent. And so we go back and forth, and we we make these, these promises to God, and yet we struggle to keep them. Some of us stand before uh, God in a moment like this in front of a group of people, and we enter into another covenant, a covenant called marriage. 
in which we stand and we declare before God, God, today is a day in which I'm going to stand before you and I'm going to say, I do. I'm going to, uh, to give my life to this person and this spouse through thick or thin, good or bad. No matter what happens in our life, God, I'm going, I promise to you, today is the day in which I'm going to follow you and give my life to this person. I declare that in front of you. And yet we enter into marriage, and marriage becomes difficult, and it's hard for all of us. And then we enter into other covenants. Sometimes relationships with the local church in which we come, we say, okay, today is the day in which I'm going to declare that uh, this is my church home. And I'm going to worship in this place, and I'm going to serve in this place, and I'm going to give in this place, and I'm going to help this group of people, and we're going to grow together in Christ, and I'm going to grow up in faith. And that happens for a time, and we struggle to meet those obligations, right? Am I alone in this? We all make these promises to God. We all declare that we're going to, to be faithful to Him, and we have the best, best of intentions. But somewhere along the way, things get hard, and we struggle, and we sin against the living God. And we look a lot like those people in the book of Nehemiah who declared promises but had a hard, found it very difficult to keep them. But the good news is that that has been done for us in Jesus. The good news of the gospel is that all of God's promises are found in him. And so while we struggle with these things and God wants us to wrestle with these things and he calls us to be obedient and to follow him no matter what, we can rest easy at night knowing that Jesus has done that for us. And through the cross, he suffered and died so that all of our sins would be forgiven. And all of God's promises might be fulfilled in him. And that's why that's so important. We know something that they did not know, right? Right? They did not know when Messiah was coming. We know that he has come, and we've placed our faith and trust in him. And so this morning, I want to give you two truths to help you as you think about the promises that you have made to God. Based upon these four passages of Scripture, these four, I should say, chapters of Scripture, and here's the first one. God's requirements are found within his word. We know that. We've seen that. God's people, as they were studying his word, God began to speak to them. The law is perfect, the psalmist says. God's law is found within his word. It's a perfect law. The problem is we are not, and we break that law. But the good news is that, that his law has been stated to us. We, we know what God expects of us. He has given us his word. But much more important than that is the second one, and that is that God's rewards are found in his son. Those promises have been fulfilled in Jesus. While we struggle and we fail and we sometimes break those promises and we want to be promise keepers too because God is a promise keeper, we have to stop and realize that until we have received it, until we're a promise receiver, we can't be a promise keeper, right? Until we've received the promises of God in Jesus. And so we are called to belong, to keep our promises just as God has kept his. You know, several weeks ago, I was looking through some old photographs. Do you ever do that? Looking through some old pictures that I had found, and sometimes I, I like to just kind of see those old pictures, and I was kind of collecting them from uh, my phones and my, uh, you know, different uh, uh, cameras and trying to bring them together, and so I started uploading them to a website. I don't know if you're familiar with a website called Flickr, but if you need to do this kind of a thing, it's a pretty good website and allows you to kind of organize different things, and so I, I started to do that, and I started looking back at some of my old photos, and I found some from 1999. Way back when, all right? 1999, I was looking at those, those photos, and I, I noticed that there was a group of photos that were all taken at the RCA Dome in downtown Indianapolis. At that time, I had just moved to Indianapolis. I had been here only a few months, and I was working for a company here, and 
I went down to the RCA Dome way before Lucas Oil Stadium for, for our young people. They're like, well, RCA Dome? What, what is that? But I went down to the RCA Dome, and I, I, I remember going to a conference, a convention with my dad with my brothers and some of the men from his church. It was a promise keepers convention. And I can remember sitting in that stadium. I can remember looking out and seeing thousands and thousands of, of men. I can remember listening to the preachers as they stood up and they spoke God's word and they called men to be obedient to the promises that they had said that they would keep. I can remember what it was like to worship with tens of thousands of guys. Didn't always smell the best, but, you know, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing, right? It was like a huge locker room filled with these mighty warriors of God who had come together, and they were worshiping uh, their creator, and they were celebrating and singing praises to the name of Jesus, and it was, it was a beautiful thing. And I remember what that was like, and I talked to my dad recently about some of that to those times, and I said, my father, I said, so what was it that made this such a special time for you? And he said, well, years before that moment, I had uh, been thinking about how within our culture, we really struggle to, to help our men to understand the role that they've been called to. And I really felt and, and sensed this, uh, this idea that men are struggling to understand what they've been called to do and to truly be leaders in their homes and in their families and in their places of, of work, in the local church. And I saw that, and I started to ask my pastor, what, what can be done about this? And, and his name was Tim Kuntz. And Pastor Kuntz said to him, have you heard about promise keepers? And so my dad started doing some research, and my dad started uh, purchasing their materials, and he started going to their conferences, and he, then he started to bring my brothers and I. And I think my dad did that because he wanted his sons to understand the importance of what it means to be a promise keeper. He wanted his sons to keep the promises that they make when they speak those words and say, I promise you. And he wanted us to understand that when we make a promise to God, that's significant. When we make a promise before God to our spouse, to our children, to people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is huge. And my dad was a promise keeper. My father was a promise keeper. And you know what? Our Heavenly Father is a promise keeper. And this morning, as we stop and we think about Nehemiah chapters 9 through 13, we see all the things that were happening to the people. We see how they made promises that they did not keep. But we see the end of that book, and it reminds us of the truth that Jesus is coming. And that in him, we have been given the fulfillment of all of God's promises so that when you and I stumble and fall and we do not keep the promises that we have declared, that we can find forgiveness and salvation and obedience and rewards and ultimately eternity in him. And so this morning, I want us to see as a church family the need for us to be promise keepers to one another to our families, and ultimately to God. Keep your promise to God and receive his in Jesus. You and I need to keep the promises that we've made before our Heavenly Father and to one another and remember the promises that have been fulfilled in our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, as we come before you this morning, and as we stop and we think about all of these things, these truths from the end of this book, our heart hurts and our heart longs for those people who, like us, made a commitment to you, and yet because of life and the things that take place, struggled to be obedient. And God, we declare to you that, that all of us 
but then the commitments that we have made have struggled to obey that and to keep the promises we've made. But we thank you and we praise you for Jesus. And we ask that on this day, you would strengthen us and encourage us and help us to collectively be promise keepers and to keep the promises that we've made to you and to our spouse and to our friends, our church family, to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to follow you and we want to honor you. And Jesus, we thank you that the promises that God has made have been fulfilled in you. And we praise you for that, and we pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.